Right now, we are in the beginning of a fourth industrial revolution, and additive manufacturing will be a key component. But how did 3D printing start? Who made the first 3D printer? When did 3D printers become mainstream, and what all has been accomplished with 3D printing already? In this video, we will discuss all of that and more in the history of 3D printing. Hi, my name is Kenny Rains, and this is Rainmaker 3D. Today we are going to be looking at the history of 3D printing. This is a part of my free course, Introduction to 3D Printing. Be sure to check out the other videos if you haven't already, and subscribe to be updated on future videos. All videos used are linked in the description below. And with all that said, let's take a look at how 3D printing got started. Modern 3D printing got its start with a few men, but two notable ones are Dr. Komoda and Charles Chuck Hull. Dr. Komoda came up with the concept of SLA, stereolithography, 3D printing, but failed to get a patent, while Chuck Hull followed through and got a patent and made the SLA-1. Chuck Hull went on to start 3D Systems, which is to this day one of the major players in 3D printing. Scott Crump developed and patented FDM 3D printing and started Stratasys, another major 3D printing company. Carl Decker developed SLS, Selective Laser Centering, 3D printing, and with all of that, the three major technologies of 3D printing were born. Binder jetting was discovered at MIT in 1993, and the first 3D printed bladder was printed at Wake Forest in 1999. 3D Systems acquired DTM to become the leader in both SLS and SLA 3D printing. Now we get to the fun part. When the patent on FDM had run its course, it created a race to make the first affordable consumer 3D printer. The first attempt at an affordable FDM printer was the RepRap project, headed up by Adrian Boyer. Let's take a look at a video from Thomas Sandlander, where he had a discussion with Adrian Boyer about RepRap. Why specifically 3D printing? There are really two aspects to it. Um, the first was not anything to do with 3D printing, it was to do with the idea of a self-replicating machine. Um, now, I've been interested in self-replication as uh, something to do in engineering as opposed to something to do in biology um, ever since I was a child. I can't put an origin on that because it goes back as far as I can remember. As far as RepRap is concerned, what happened was in 2000, the British government gave my university a, a large equipment grant and I bought two 3D printing machines, expensive ones, because you couldn't get cheap ones then. Uh, one of them cost about um, a third of a million dollars and the other one cost about $50,000. And that's as cheap as you could go back in 2000, 2001, about when it was. But as soon as we got these machines, I realized that for the first time we had a technology that stood a chance and be able to copy itself because it's such a versatile manufacturing technology. I thought basically this can make a lot of the bits for making another one of itself. And of course that tied in with my interest in self-replication. So I had a, I want to make a self-replicating machine. Here's a machine that stands a chance of doing it. Many of the 3D printers on the market today are based on the original RepRap design. One big issue people had was a lack of printable 3D models. You had to be proficient in 3D CAD in order to have anything to print. This all changed in 2008 with Thingiverse, which was and still is a repository for 3D models where you can go and find something to print. Also in 2008, the first prosthetic leg was printed. In 2009, the floodgates of affordable 3D printers started to open as the FDM patent had run out. One of the first printers to come out was the MakerBot Cupcake, followed up by MakerBot's Thingomatic. I actually bought a MakerBot Thingomatic back in 2011, and the first thing I 3D printed was a snow sculpture that my dad made of a dog. I was hooked after that, and I started to print all sorts of different things. So let's take a look at a Thingomatic with then CEO Bree Pettis. The speed of the MakerBot, and layer by layer, it builds up your model. Right now, it's printing out a bunny rabbit. It comes as a kit, so you put it together, and when you're done, you've got a machine that can make you almost anything. It takes the, the, we have plastic down here in a coil, and it comes up through this tube, and you can actually see it coming in here. That sounds, feels like it's stuck. And uh, it goes in here, gets heated up, and then layer by layer. I love my thing Thingomatic. Even though it was a little guy, it got my mind racing on what could be with 3D printing. 
My mind wasn't the only thing racing. There were lots of companies that were racing to be the first affordable consumer 3D printer. Companies like Formlabs and MakerBot and Ultimaker were all racing. So that said, let's check out a couple videos from their printers that they had back then in the early days. I've been involved in the field of personal fabrication for five years now, and I've seen what an amazing impact that these tools can have. But I've also realized that these tools are just a fraction of what's possible. When we were at the Media Lab at MIT, we had access to an amazing set of tools, 3D printing being one of the most important. For designers and engineers like us, there was simply no solution if you want a high resolution 3D printer at low cost on your desk. So we decided to build it ourselves. For the daredevils out there, the Doc Browns, the MacGyvers, the test pilots, we haven't forgot about you. We created the MakerBot Replicator 2X Experimental 3D Printer for you to push the boundaries of what's next. It is the most full-featured, sophisticated, and future-proof 3D printer on the market. The freshly redesigned heated build platform and the brand new enclosure are set up to optimize your experience with MakerBot ABS filaments. For my second 3D printer, I actually ended up selecting the MakerBot Replicator 2X, which I still have, and I even printed off a prosthetic hand with it. This is the cyborg hand, so I printed this out for my buddy, he can't move his fingers, but he can move his wrist, so he puts this on his left hand, and when he moves his wrist down, the fingers close, and when he lets go, the fingers return back to normal. I printed off all sorts of stuff in college, for college projects, and even just for tinkering and making toys. So now let's take a look at Irby, the first 3D printed car. There have been many more 3D printed cars since Irby. One of the coolest was the 3D printed Lamborghini that we get to see in my video on applications of 3D printing. In 2011, Cornell starts working on food 3D printers, and in 2012, the first prosthetic jaw is 3D printed and implanted in a patient. President Obama even discussed 3D printing in his State of the Union address. Let's take a look at the trailer for the Netflix film Print the Legend, where we get to see part of that. Everybody thought home computers were a really, really cool thing that only nerdy people were ever going to be into. 3D printers are on that same kind of arc. We're out to fuel the next industrial revolution by putting the power to manufacture things in your hands. 3D printing has the potential to revolutionize the way we make almost everything. Some of I love this movie. And I would highly recommend checking it out if you want to learn more about 3D printing and especially about the history of 3D printing. Next, we get started in super fast 3D printing with Clip technology. So let's take a look at Clip. refer to this as clip. It has three functional components. One, it has a reservoir that holds the puddle just like the T1000. At the bottom of the reservoir is a special window. I'll come back to that. In addition, it has a stage that will lower into the puddle and pull the object out of the liquid. The third component is a digital light projection system underneath the reservoir illuminating with light in the ultraviolet region. Now, the key is that this window in the bottom of this reservoir is got, it's a composite. It's a very special window. It's not only transparent to light, but it's permeable to oxygen. It's got characteristics like a contact lens. Clip is pretty mind-blowing to me. It's so much faster than the current printers that I have. In 2016, Daniel Kelly's lab announces that they can 3D print bone. With that said, let's take a look at this TED Talk by Anthony Atala, 
to see the incredible progress in 3D printing in the medical field. Another technology that we've used is actually that of printing. This is actually a desktop inkjet printer, but instead of using ink, we're using cells. And you can actually see here the printhead going through and printing this structure, and it takes about 40 minutes to print this structure. And there's a 3D elevator that then actually goes down one layer at a time each time the printhead goes through. And then finally, you're able to get that structure out. It, you can pop that structure out of the printer and implant it. And this is actually a, a piece of uh, bone that I'm going to show you in this slide that was actually created with this desktop printer and implanted, as you see here. That's all new bone that was implanted using uh, these techniques. Another uh, more advanced technology we're looking at right now, our next generation of technologies are more sophisticated printers. This particular printer we're designing now is actually one where we print right on the patient. So what you see here is, I know it sounds funny, but <laughs> that's the way it works, because in reality, what you want to do is you actually want to have the patient on the bed with the wound, and you have a scanner, basically like a flatbed scanner. That's what you see here on the right side. You see a scanner technology that first scans the wound on the patient, and then it comes back with the print hits, actually printing the layers that you require on the patients themselves. This is how it actually works. Here's a scanner going through, scanning the wound. Once it's scanned, sends information in, in layers, the correct layers of cells where they need to be. And now you're going to see here a, a demo of this, this actually being done uh, in, in, a, in a representative wound. And we actually do this with a gel, so that you can lift the gel material. So once those cells are on the patient, they will stick where they need to be. And this is actually new technology still and their development. We're also working on more sophisticated printers, because in reality, our biggest challenge are the solid organs. I don't know if you realize this, but 90% of the patients on the transplant list are actually waiting for a kidney. Patients are dying every day, because we don't have enough of those organs to go around. So this is more challenging. Large organ, vascular, a lot of blood vessel supply, a lot of cells present. So the strategy here is this is actually a CT scan, an X-ray, and we go layer by layer using computerized morphometric imaging analysis and 3D reconstruction to get right down to those patients' own kidneys. We then are able to actually image those, do 360-degree rotation to actually analyze the kidney in its full uh, volumetric uh, characteristics, and we then are able to actually take this information and then scan this in a printing computerized form so we go layer by layer through the organ, analyzing each layer as we go through the organ, and we then are able to send that information, as you see here, through the computer and actually design the organ for the patient. This actually shows the actual printer, and this actually shows that printing. In fact, we actually have the printer right here. So um, it's in, while we've been talking today, we've actually, uh, uh, you can actually see the printer back here in, in the backstage. That's actually the actual printer right now, and that's been printing this uh, kidney structure that you see here. Uh, it takes about seven hours to print the kidneys. This is about three hours into it now. And Dr. Kang's going to walk on stage right now, and we're actually going to show you one of these kidneys uh, that we printed a little bit earlier today. Put a pair of gloves here. Thank you. Go backwards. So these gloves are a little bit small on me, but here it is. You can actually see that kidney as it was printed earlier today. Watching that clip makes me wonder what the future holds for this technology. That was all the way back in 2013. Imagine where they are today. Next we move on to 3D printing homes and structures. In 2017, Europe has its first 3D printed residential home. Let's look at 3D printing homes in this clip.
concrete printers are awesome and someday I hope to have one in my shop. So today what you're starting to see is a huge decrease in price in both FDM printers and now resin printers with the new technology of LCD 3D printing becoming mainstream and very low cost due to cell phones. You can get a high quality, extremely high resolution resin 3D printer for under $500. Here's a time lapse of one of my resin 3D printers. Today, two of the biggest breakthrough technologies in 3D printing are volumetric printing and high area rapid printing, or HARP. We take a look in depth at these two technologies in my video, Future of 3D Printing, which we'll check out a preview of right now. If we could look into the future of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, what would we see? Would we see 3D printed organs and human beings like in Westworld? Will we all have replicators in our home to instantly get our ice water? Are future colonies of human beings going to live on Mars in 3D printed homes? The possibilities are endless for additive manufacturing. And in this video, we are going to take a look at the future of 3D printing. So that wraps it up. So now you know how this revolution got kickstarted. And just remember, we're writing history today. Hi, this is Kenny Rains with Rainmaker 3D. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to press the like button if you learned anything or enjoyed the video. And also smash that subscribe button for more tips, tricks, tutorials, and time lapses.